Okay, so for somebody who knows nothing of TPM, how would you say it has benefited the club? Um, well, as the science and medicine department, you can imagine we put a lot of resources into injury prevention. Uh, Pre-season is certainly a key time where we run a, a battery of tests on the players. The performance matrix gives us a framework, it's a template, something that we can hang our ideas and philosophies off. Um, but by, we don't get lost anywhere along the way. We've got a system that we can hang our philosophies off and it points us in a, a consistent direction. Um, I think it's just as applicable at first team level as it is across the academy from young ages, eights right through to under 21s. But neither is it sports specific either. You know, we can take it out into the, uh, into the private healthcare sector, working with anyone from sort of weekend warriors to just a general active population really. And the results seem to uh, point us in the right direction. But during testing, uh, rather than sort of identifying if benchmarks are reached, um, the system looks more how the benchmarks are reached. So what do you feel this approach gives to the athlete? Um, well, it doesn't pin down the athlete's competency to perform a single test. It does it across a battery of tests. Um, some of those tests are regular functional movements that we perform on, on a daily basis. And in, in other instances, we break it down to the component parts, really. Uh, and what we're looking for is rather than how they do in one particular test, are the theme, general themes across the board. You know, it gives it us an opportunity to explore, explore movement variability across a wide continuum. For instance, we might see a specific movement fault occurring in four or five different tests. Mm. And as a result, it's a, a far better tool to appraise movement than a single test would be in its own right. Okay. And sticking with testing for a little bit mm. more, um, we test both at a low and a high threshold to find these different movement impairments we're looking for. Again, how do you feel this distinctions help you actually change or influence players' movement? Um, well, I think in sport, um, athletes are used to doing performance tests, tests that by their very nature require a, a lot of athletic ability and are quite hard to do. When it comes to the type of exercise they like to produce, um, uh, when it comes to the type of exercises that they like to perform, they'll usually head for the gym, pick up a, a heavy weight or perform a fast explosive activity. As a result, we find a number of athletes actually test quite well in high threshold situations and it's the low threshold situations that are actually the problem. Okay, and in addition to testing at low and high, high threshold, um, the system identifies these risks in movement through sight and direction. Uh, how do you, again, do you feel this labeling process of movement um, aids your clinical reasoning and what you give in terms of interventions? Um, I think when we start talking about movement, um, people straight away look at the work that comes from sort of a biomechanics background. Mm. Um, and certainly the, the terminology that gets used in, in that arena it's quite difficult to understand. Um, it might be a degree or a master's degree in its own right, really. Um, by using the terms sight and direction of movement, they're terms that, that are fairly simple for us to, to get a grasp of. Uh, and so as a result, it enables us to use these terms within a variety of practitioners, those from a sports science background, uh, a medical background, or even some of our allied healthcare practitioners. They're terms I think that they can easily identify and learn to use. Okay. And the system, once you've done the test, generates a report. How do you decide what to target with any given player based on that report? Well, the nice thing about the report is, as you alluded to earlier, it separates what, uh, what movement dysfunctions happen in a high threshold or a low threshold environment. Clearly, when we see dysfunction in a high threshold situation, we have to be quite careful about the exercise prescription within the gym setting, for instance. Um, so it's useful from that perspective. But where a lot of uh, reports are generated are quite critical of an athlete's movement, these reports, these reports generate what might be a, an asset as well. So it's not just mm -hmm. critical, it identifies an at-risk area, but it suggests what areas uh, are assets that, that we can further strengthen and target performance-related gains in that area. So the system is more than just testing. Um, so once you have that report, how do you feel the retraining strategies, maybe the muscle-specific direction control approaches? Again, how does that help you manage the player? Well, in simple terms, if we know that the sight and direction that the movement happens and we know the threshold, um, maybe the test in itself becomes the exercise, and that's a good starting place. But from that, we have the ability to progress and regress accordingly, really. For instance, in a, a low threshold situation, we probably want a wide base of support. We might eliminate gravity, or we might go to maybe a reformer setting where we're using springs to assist movement rather than to resist it. Whereas if, we, if it's a, a high threshold situation, we might be looking to apply a, a higher load, if you like, or even an unstable surface. Okay, so really sort of differentiating what is required based on what the report has shown in terms of the retraining strategies. Absolutely, yeah. And then quite often the final piece of the puzzle is trying to bridge that gap from gym or sort of remedial work onto the field of play with something that's functional. 
So for you as a really experienced clinician, uh, working in football for a long time, how do you feel working with the system has further developed your skills? I think, um, I think no matter how much experience you've got, it's quite easy when you're, when you're doing a rehab to start to focus on the goal a little bit. Um, and particularly as, as an athlete gets into sort of more end stage rehab onto, onto the field of play, we might not want to go back to look at sort of lower threshold situations, but the, the system as it stands is a framework that we would go back to and perform a battery of tests right at the very end. So rather than all tests being progressive and get, we're having harder and harder elements to it, we know what the, the players like at baseline from pre-season and we can go back and test those lower threshold situations as well. And very often, just because they're in a gym lifting big weights or running around at speed, we might still have some low threshold um, issues there to deal with. And the only way we know that is if we continue to go back and retest. Okay, so that, that ability to rescreen, go back to the initial report, see how we've, uh, we've moved on or not is, is very useful. Yeah, I, I think test retest and within the football calendar and the fixture calendar, we do try and do that several times throughout the season. Um, in an ideal world, we do it more frequently than we currently do. Um, but particularly with a fit player or a player that's returned back from a long injury, we're keen to do individual testing, sometimes on a, on a two monthly basis, really.